uh, Clay Shirky has was teaching in Shanghai um, and has had a lot of Chinese students, so has uh, been exposed to their thinking on uh, social media. I know I, I have Chinese students in my classes, and some of them will say there is no censorship in China. Um, you know, we can read and watch anything we want. Uh, actually, you Westerners have it totally wrong, and um, uh, you know, back off. Um, what are you complaining about anyway? We can we can buy anything we want. We can chat with anyone we want. We 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 date. We do everything on the internet. What are you complaining about? Um, Talk, tell us about uh, your view from the classroom. Yeah, well, so this, this was actually an amazing experience. So I studied social media, and I was in Shanghai helping NYU open our uh, undergraduate campus there. So I, I have had students now from freshman year to senior year. I've seen the whole suite of uh, their engagement with social media because NYU paid me to spend several hours a week talking to Chinese teenagers about social media, I saw their views change in exactly the way that, that, that Minky is alluding to. Um, the, the, the interesting thing about, uh, I think about PRC citizens right now, that Americans don't often understand is they are fiercely patriotic, but across a much wider spectrum of patriotism uh, than we're accustomed to here. So in the American context, and Kaiser and I were just talking about this before, uh, before the panel started, in the American context, patriotism is associated with my country right or wrong. But there is a kind of patriotism, particularly among the 90s generation, who grew up in a China that had already become great, had already clearly achieved uh, essentially the greatest economic growth for the largest number of people ever in the history of economic time series you know, worldwide. Um, their patriotism is often China can do anything it puts its mind to. But that patriotism often translates to China can fix its own problems, even if Beijing might prefer my country right or wrong. And in the face of this sense of China is becoming stronger, the, the parallel experience of the media environment for these students is exactly that they lived under Hu Jintao, mm -hmm. and now this. And so in their junior high and high school years, as they were becoming more adult people, the environment was opening up to them. And in their college years, it is closing down. And there is now no mistake <coughs> that closing down. There was a period where uh, there is very little censorship. Of course, the government censors hardcore pornography and any low uh, international uh, users who, who distinctly want to harm China. But other than those two narrow categories, we can talk to anyone we want, we can say anything we want. Uh, that ended for, certainly for, for the students at, at MIT Shanghai, that largely ended around the end of the dome censorship, the, the, um, the documentary that was posted online but not on television. Um, and where, as Kaiser mentioned, Weibo had already been controlled as a public sphere by, by 2015 when, when Under the Dome comes out. And you might just, would you describe that? Sure. Under right? the Dome is essentially the um, inconvenient truth of China. Um, there is a CCTV reporter who leaves her job as a reporter and spends a year reporting on environmental issues, uh, air, water, soil. Um, but particular focus on air, uh, and creates this documentary in which she interviews government employees on camera. Um, it is pointed to by many government outlets, so it is clearly with the permission of the state, but appears only online. And the big difference between Weibo, which, which Kaiser was referring to, and which is imperfectly analogous to China's Twitter, but is maybe more importantly, China's first truly national uh, public sphere of conversation, Controls were put on that in 2013, but, but WeChat, Weixin, is allowed to flourish. Weixin has the model of WhatsApp, or, uh, well, yeah, Weixin has the model of WhatsApp, maybe most closely, which is people are connected in two-way pipes. It's not a broadcast medium, it's a conversational medium. And as such, it creates smaller, denser conversational groups. It doesn't create the risk of large-scale virality the way a Twitter or a Weibo so Feb 28, 2015, rolls around, up this, up this, uh, this documentary goes. 
And many, in fact, most WeChat users feed erupts with people in their moments, in their kind of um, share with your friends tool, this one picture of a smog laden traffic jam in Beijing. And what the government had not, I think, counted on is that little plus little plus little equals big. And that, in fact, the WeChat was, uh, WeChat was an effective medium for viral spread because the natural tendency of small group two-way social networks to suppress conversation is what I've <laughs> experienced at Thanksgiving, which is, uh, I don't want to talk to my racist uncle, right? I mean, that mode of just don't bring up politics, don't bring up religion, don't bring up gender. Uh, but what the government had forgotten is there is no pro-pollution uncle, right? There is no one in China who's like, yeah, bring it on. I'm going to nail all PM 2.5 you can send out. Right? And so the discussion about economic growth from burning cheap, unwashed coal versus uh, tamping down economic growth to clean up the environment, that took place entirely within the government. There was no debate among the populace. And the government, in what I think is the largest numerical act of censorship ever in the history of the world, took down the video after a couple hundred million people had seen it, um, took it offline, took all the conversations offline retroactively. And from then until now, the rate of changes in both censorship and critically propaganda, and this is one thing I want to add, uh, effectively my giant footnote to the report would be to also look at, at, at the change in propaganda, the, the merging of the press and publications agency with the film, radio, and television agency, uh, the amping up of the competition between this new super censorship agency and the cyberspace administration, at the, two days ago or yesterday, the endogenization of all of that mechanism to the party instead of the state, all of that is kicked off, um, or rather amps up in, in, in 2015. And the interesting thing is, like just in, in, in China two weeks ago, I got on the plane headed for an authoritarian technocracy, and I landed in a dictatorship if she wants it that way. Um, the, the change, the 14th article of the Constitutional Changes was published while I was on the plane. I land uh, in Shanghai, and the conversation there with old friends and you know, former students and so forth, um, it's difficult to convey the shock even among people who were cynical about the degree to which the Constitution uh, was previously an obstacle to, to Xi's ability to, to internalize power. And part of what they were shocked about is that censorship, the ring of censorship, which had been originally conceived of as this great firewall that people, I think, still wrongly talk about, had shrunk down to people sensing that there was a wall around them. This is Ben Dursky's Great Hive, which he talks about, which you guys, I think, very smartly uh, pull, out in, pull out in the report. Uh, people were trying to have a conversation with close friends back and forth on an app specifically designed to support that and experiencing an inability to even speak to nearby levels. And China's always had a tolerance for sort of small street talk, alleyway talk. As long as it doesn't get too big, as long as it doesn't get too public, whatever. Not even, not even that. Just, just don't say it. Don't say William who Don't say the number fourteen. Don't say the letter N. Uh, just on and on. And the, 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 the regime that Minky referred to, which is, look, you have this giant boisterous, it's the most active social media sphere in the world. It's the most active e-commerce sphere in the world. It's amazing tools. It's incredibly focused on user experience. Um, it's not censored except at the edges. Like that, that faith is just increasingly hard to support because people are experiencing it in day-to-day in -day conversations about matters of real political interest. And I think one of the big changes that we're seeing that in the social media environment that I, that I just felt last week palpably with my students is this sense of any belief that censorship was temporary while the country grew, was 
remaining about the poor coal miners in Shanxi who couldn't really understand what was going on and had to do this for a while, but then China would open up. Like, that's all. And they now understand themselves to be an environment that is essentially nearly permanently locked. 